Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on your location. And welcome to Fish and Richardson's Post-Grant for Practitioners webinar series. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about inter partes review of design patents. My name is Jim Babineau, and I have with me here Craig Deutsch. And between the two of us, uh, we hope to keep you entertained and informed for the next hour. So uh, I want you to thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you uh, who are interested, our biographies appear on the side of your screen. If you're joining the Post-Grant for Practitioners webinar series for the first time, uh, this monthly series explores developments in post-grant proceedings and related practice tips. Uh, we're excited to have you join us today. I invite you to mark your calendars for the next meeting, October 12th. The Post-Grant for Practitioner webinar series takes place every second Wednesday of the month. Today's webinar will run for an hour and includes a question and answer period at the end. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program by clicking the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. We'll do our best to answer them all at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Uh, please also feel free to contact us personally after the webinar if that's easier. Uh, before we get started, I should remind you the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only. It does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or case situation. As a very simple agenda today, we're going to, as always, take you through the updated statistics on uh, post-grant and IPR, uh, some of them updated as early as recently as today. Then we'll talk about claim construction as it applies to design patents and how the PTAB analyzes obviousness in light of claim construction. And then, of course, as always, we'll give you some resources at the end. So on to the first topic. The, uh, you see on your screen the, the static uh, status is of the end of August, um, and for 2016 we look like we're on record on track to uh, process practically as many IPRs as in 2015 um, by the time the year is over. Now, of those uh, of the uh, post-grant IPRs, um, you'll see from this slide that uh, by technology area, design patents occupy just one percentage of the um, of the, the IPRs that are that are instituted or filed. I, I will say that uh, even though it's only one percent, uh, it is on the rise. Craig, thanks, Jim. Yeah, so let's let's dig in a little more closely at uh, the, the statistics for design patents at the PTAB. Um, and you, you may not have heard about many design patent decisions because there just haven't been that many petitions filed. Uh, 26 total IPR petitions filed to design patents compared to, uh, as you saw in the previous slides, several thousand directed to utility subjects. Two PGRs of design patents have been filed. Uh, we won't focus today on PGR proceedings, but I will note here that, uh, of course, it is something that's available for design patents, uh, having a priority date after March 2013. Um, it can be filed within nine months of issuance of the patent. Uh, and in, in some circumstances, it, it can be advantageous because of additional grounds of unpatentability that may be raised uh, against design patents in PGR proceedings as opposed to an IPR, um, including lack of ornamentality, uh, inventorship issues, uh, which have been raised in, in these two PGRs uh, that have been filed so far. Um, a significant trade-off, however, being the severe estoppel that can attach, in, in part because of these additional uh, grounds that are available, um, and also a higher threshold for institution uh, applies to PGR as, as compared to IPR proceedings. Um, so anyway, these, these issues uh, were addressed in more depth in our previous installment in this series, which is available at fishpostgrant.com, uh, but just wanted to raise that briefly here. Uh, so now, you know, looking at these statistics showing 26 IPRs filed since the proceedings were established, uh, perhaps not the statistic to lead off with to show uh, the relevance of today's discussion, um, but as, as Jim mentioned, despite the small number so far, there's an upward trend, and I would suggest that this trend is, is going to continue. Um, looking back over the past few years, 
Uh, we see five, three, and four petitions filed in 2013, 2014, and 2015, respectively. Uh, and then this year so far, 14 have been filed to date. Uh, so a, a significant jump. And I think there's a few reasons for this. Uh, you know, most simply that the number of issue design patents is increasing, uh, although perhaps there's a bit of a plateau in those numbers, um, and certainly a broader awareness of the value that design patents can offer. So I think simply by virtue of, of those numbers and, and the broader awareness, uh, more design patents are finding their way into litigation and uh, IPR proceedings. Uh, and I, I think this trend will continue uh, even after the upcoming Supreme Court decision in Apple v. Samsung, uh, however that turns out. Uh, of course, the issue um, there being when a design patent is applied only to a component of a product, should an award of profits be apportioned or uh, should damages be awarded as they have been uh, with, with total profits being awarded. So if the, if the Supreme Court decides yes on that question, uh, damages are limited from what's currently available, uh, and, and perhaps there's some tempering of that upward trend. Uh, but we'll see what happens. The, the oral, oral argument is coming up early October, so something to watch there. Uh, looking at the 14 IPRs that were filed in, in 2016, there's actually only a handful of disputes represented, uh, each involving several design patents. And I think this is also representative of a trend going back, I mean, several years now, uh, towards filing multiple partial designs for a given uh, commercial product versus going back further historically when it was more common to file a, a single design directed to an entire product. Um, so this, you know, for a given dispute leads to additional IPR proceedings. Of those uh, 26, the PTAP has acted on 14 petitions, the 12 that were filed previously and a couple filed early in 2016. And so far, the institution rate has uh, come out at about 57%. Um, so even comparing that to technology areas that have had a relatively low institution rate, uh, the institution rate for design claims is, is lower. Um, although, you know, I think looking broadly, we're seeing a, a trend towards a lower institution rate across the board, so perhaps that's closing a bit. Um, but I think at any rate, what this shows is there's no guarantee that uh, IPRs of a design patent will be instituted. Um, Digging into that a little more substantively, it's, I think it's dangerous to look, uh, draw too much from the numbers itself. Um, four out of the eight that were instituted were based on prior art grounds directed to the same product as, as the design patent. Uh, so in one case, there was a priority claim to utility filing that didn't hold up, uh, resulting in an earlier publication being prior art. In another group, there were publications of what was essentially the same commercial product that uh, the design patent was, was directed to. So in those cases, there's really little question about the prior art uh, rendering the claim anticipated or obvious. It, the issue really came down to uh, whether the publications were, were prior art. So if, we, if we look uh, only at cases where there was not this kind of priority issue or you know, something amounting to a mistake. Uh, the number of institutions on third-party non-patent owner prior art is, is low, four out of 14 petitions. Um, so what we're left with is, is very few institutions based on non-patent owner prior art, again, signaling uh, how, how difficult it can be to gain institution and, and invalidate many design patents. Um, I think also as a petitioner, it's, it's a reminder that when looking for prior art, uh, looking to patent owners' own, own publications is often a great way to start. And I think 
it's even more common to uh, find that kind of prior art in the design patent context. Um, and on the flip side, as you know, a, a prosecutor or applicant preparing design applications, it's uh, critical to keep an eye on, on what publications have been out there. Of the institutions, only uh, only a, a small subset have been based on 103 combinations, and we'll we'll talk more about the obviousness standard that's applied in the design patent context and, and why that uh, might be the case. Um, I think overall, although there's a different standard, part of these numbers reflect simply that in, in many of the design patents that have been challenged and you know, many design patents generally are are narrow. Um, they protect the ornamental appearance as shown in, in a set of drawings. Uh, and so even our publications that might be in the same area uh, directed to something that serves the same function, uh, it may look different. So comparing to utility patent statistics, I think the institution rate is lower and uh, perhaps more comparable to a subset of narrow utility claims. Uh, so with that background on statistics, we'll turn to the, the two substantive so topics uh, to consider in IPRs of design patents, whether as a petitioner or a patent owner. Uh, and those are claim construction and obviousness, which we'll walk through um, of the, the rules and then a few examples of how the PTAB has uh, applied those rules. First, uh, and, and briefly, we'll take a look at design patents generally and you know, see how that plays into claim construction. Jim? Well, thanks, Craig. Uh, just This will be a very brief primer on design patents. Uh, set up the stage for the claim construction and obviousness analysis. As most people on the call are probably aware, design patents are uh, very easy to draft in comparison to utility applications. They have very few words. And ultimately, the claim is defined by primarily the drawings and any description that's included, but often the description is very limited. We have an example here, a um, hypothetical example of claiming the design for an electrical plug-in connector as set forth in the specification. It shows a couple of figures. And the claim is, I claim the ornamental design for an electrical plug-in connector. So we're, the claim is not to the plug-in connector. That's a key point. It's to the design for that. Um, the, you'll see the drawings have some lines that are solid and some lines that are dashed or grayed out. Um, and on the, some surfaces, there is shading marks and some surfaces not. The solid lines and the shading are what delineate the, the boundary of, of the claimed subjects. In other words, the part that's, that's bounded by those solid lines and, and with those shading lines is, is the claimed design. The other parts are not. Um, in fact, it looks like usually there's a broken line statement, as you see here, that these only serve the uh, purpose of showing environmental uh, uh, features. So for example, if, if someone were to create a micro USB connector that had the same body shape, even though smaller, um, presumably this same design would cover that. Um, so given that the, 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 the claims of, and the, the scope of the claims of the, of the design patent or in the drawings, that puts the PTAB in a, in, a, in a bit of a different position with respect to uh, how to go about their, their, uh, their business. So, uh, in, this, in the context of an IPR, for example, one of the things the PTAB has to do first is construe the claim. And you know, you've heard the adage, a picture is a thousand words. Um, our Supreme Court likes to say, we know it when we see it. Um, with claim construction with a design patent, in order for the appellate group, the, the, um, the Fed Circuit, for example, to really review what's been done, the PTAB really has to come up with some explanation of what they can think the design scope is, and they have to do this in words. So they do apply the broadest reasonable interpretation standard, in theory the same as is applied to utility patents at the patent office and at the PTAB. Um, 
but the key here with uh, design patents, a little different, is that the trial court has to essentially translate the design's visual description into some words. So they are going to point out what features and attributes of those features that are shown are part of the design or key to their analysis. So uh, with, that, with that background on design patents and thinking in terms of that type of claim construction, um, we're going to walk you through a couple of examples uh, of that. Craig? Sure. And uh, we'll start with uh, the, the PTAB's construction in uh, the Caterpillar B. Miller IPR, which I think provides a simple example of, of, of how they carry out this process. Um, and, and first, I mean, as a general matter, I think the PTAB has mostly followed this approach of providing a verbal construction of the claims and the, the features that they deem important in establishing the, the overall visual appearance, appearance of the claim design, um, perhaps with some variability about the, the level of detail that they're willing to go into. Uh, so here on the left is figure three of the claim design, which uh, amounts to the, the standard warning triangle that I think we've all seen before. Um, again, only the perimeter of the triangle being shown in solid lines and, and claims. Uh, and the triangle is applied to a surface that has an S-shaped curvature. So the, the PTAB construed the design claim by first referring to uh, the drawings themselves, the ornamental design of the operator visible warning system as illustrated in figures one to seven, uh, and then calling out specific features um, that contribute to the overall appearance. So the or ornamental design includes an equilateral triangle with rounded corners and a horizontal base that is shaped as if projected onto a laterally extruded S-shaped surface. Uh, so they essentially called out the features that distinguished the, the claim triangle from a typical triangle applied to a, a flat surface. Um, and then with that construction going forward, which uh, in this case was, was petitioner's proposed construction, uh, the board then proceeded in comparing uh, these features to the prior art uh, to find the, the design claim unpatentable ultimately. Um, so here in Caterpillar, you know, the, the precise construction perhaps didn't sway the outcome too dramatically, uh, just given how broad this claim was. Um, there was, I think, a high chance that it was going to be found unpatentable. Um, but like in, in utility patents, the, the verbal description that the PTAB finds appropriate is critical. Uh, because it will guide the invalidity analysis uh, and the, the subsequent comparison to the prior art. Um, and that's that's exactly what happened here with the verbal description providing an overall appearance that was then mapped uh, to petitioner's prior art, leading to the determination that the claim was unpatentable. Uh, another a more recent example from the PTAB uh, can be found in the Johns Manville Institution decision. Uh, and this, this case is interesting in part because the patent includes a single color photo, which is shown here, uh, of a building insulation material. Um, looking at this figure, immediately appear apparent is the brown uh, appearance with variation in color, variation in, in hue, um, and a textured surface. And also, I don't know if it, how clearly it shows, shows up, but there is a visible waffle pattern, uh, which turns out to be a remnant of the manufacturing process that's uh, used to make this insulation material. And you know, when taking a, a photo of it, it, it shows up and it appears in, in uh, the figure in the design pattern. Um, the claim, typical claim shown at the bottom, uh, and also, you know, as is typical, no, no additional substantive description in the design patent. So this is really uh, the, the substance to go off of in, in 
making the construction, there was some limited uh, prosecution history here that also uh, played a role. Um, and as an aside, it is, of course, fair game to claim color in a design patent, and, and a photo is one way to do, do that, uh, in which, at the time this application was filed, uh, the, the color figures would have been accompanied by a, a petition uh, to submit those, those color photos, or single photo here. The parties each proposed slightly different constructions. Uh, not surprisingly, petitioner arguing for a, a broad construction, patent owner arguing for a slightly narrower construction. Uh, no dispute that the claim was directed to insulation material having a cloud-like appearance, variations in a swirl pattern. Uh, that's not repeated, um, a variation of distinct hues. But there were other elements that uh, were in dispute, and in particular, uh, petitioner, in arguing for its broad construction, suggested that the design claim was not directed to a specific color at all, um, and that the waffle pattern that I had mentioned that was a remnant of the manufacturing process uh, was functional and, and also not part of the claimed ornamental design. Patent owner, arguing for uh, a slightly narrower construction, Called out multiple discrete, uh, argued that multiple discrete colors were were required by the claim and, and visible in the, the photo, um, and they specifically argued for a construction uh, including a clean color, a uh, cream color, marbleized throughout, with at least a brown color, a chocolate color, a coffee color, an almond color, and a beige color, and also that the marbleizing provides a sandstorm appearance. Uh, so first, as to the waffle pattern, um, the board, you know, the starting with the figure that, that makes up the design claim, uh, a photo was selected to show that, uh, to show the material, the waffle pattern is visible in the photo. Uh, it, it was recognized in the um, file history and, and yet not disclaimed by applicant. Uh, and also, they, they commented that it's, it's really not functional. It is surface indicia that's, that's visible uh, in the design, um, and, and thus it is part of the claimed ornamental appearance. Uh, so they, they disagreed with, with petitioner's broad construction uh, and included that. Um, regarding color, the PTAB declined to construe the claim to include the specific list of, of colors that was suggested by patent owner. Um, and they, they didn't disagree that specific colors were discernible from the photo, um, but the, those specific colors were not articulated in, in the description. Uh, there wasn't much description. Uh, they didn't show up in the prosecution history. And so the PTAB wasn't willing to call out this level of specificity in describing the, the features that uh, lead to the overall appearance of, of the design. And they went a little bit out of their way to say that uh, brown and, and cream colors, which were included in its construction, uh, were, were examples um, and not limiting or, or requiring specifically brown and cream. Uh, and they went on to say that enumerating anything further would be amount to uh, improperly bringing in limitations into the claim where there just wasn't, wasn't basis for it. Um, and the same for the sandstorm appearance, which similarly didn't appear in the record. Uh, PTAB didn't seem to think it, it added additional clarity to the characterization of the overall uh, visual impression. Um, so ultimately, the construction that the PTAB found was that the claim design depicts an insulation material having a cloud-like appearance with variations in a swirl pattern, a waffle pattern, and colors that sufficiently impart or convey a variation of distinct hues, such as brown and cream. Uh, so you know, although the board uh, construed the design claim verbally, there, there was some reluctance in going into too much specificity uh, 
pulling pulling in uh, articulating features that that didn't clearly show up somewhere, um, or at least you know where there wasn't reference to the prior art like we saw in Caterpillar. Next, one uh, one argument that often shows up in the context of claim construction uh, relates to functionality. So there have been several petitions where, um, although a design claim cannot be directly challenged as invalid as functional or lacking ornamentality, um, there have been attempts to argue for a broad construction by alleging that certain features of design are functional. Uh, and thus should not be construed as, as uh, forming part of the claimed ornamental design. So one example of that came up in the Dorman Products IPRs. Uh, there were two IPRs directed to two design patents related to vehicle headlamps. Figure one of the 429 patent is shown here. And the design, uh, the claim design included the outer surface of the headlamp, including portions of, of uh, a frame and bezel. And so petitioner looked at the frame and bezel and argued that those are purely functional. An appropriate construction of the design claim excludes these features from the claim. Uh, and in making this argument, they pointed to some evidence that such a shape uh, was, was required for aerodynamic functionality, uh, and also that the shape was dictated by corresponding fender and, and other components uh, for compatibility uh, and a secure fit. Uh, this strategy, I think, is not likely to be met with success. It, it wasn't successful here. Um, the board said these are features are not purely functional. They declined to construe the claim to eliminate these features as functional. Um, it was, it was clear that there were uh, designs that performed similarly in, ter similarly in terms of the aerodynamic and compatibility functionality that Petitioner raised. Um, and also, I think Petitioner was getting a little too close to arguing that the design was functional and in invalid for that reason under 35 U.S.C. 171, which, you know, of course, isn't, isn't proper in, in IPR. Um, so with that appropriate construction that did not exclude uh, those elements from the design claim, uh, the board ultimately went on to deny institution. I think that's the right result there on functionality. Uh, it's consistent with how the PTAB has been treating functionality arguments in terms of claim construction, um, and also more recent Federal Circuit decisions on the issue. Uh, the most recent Federal Circuit decision uh, on this topic came in April of this year. Uh, it hasn't been applied by the PTAB uh, just yet. Um, but I think it's, it's worth walking through, uh, walking through this briefly. So in Sport Dimension v. Coleman, uh, the Federal Circuit said that even if an element of a design is functional, it should not be completely eliminated as an aspect of the design claim, um, as, as petitioners like Endorman were, were arguing. Uh, the design at issue here is related to a flotation device. Um, it includes armbands and a, a central tapered section that wraps around a torso in use. The district court found that these elements ultimately were functional, the, the um, armbands and, and the taper, uh, tapering on the sides of the torso section. And then they went on to eliminate those elements from the claimed design altogether um, as functional, not ornamental, and thus, thus not properly included in the design claim. Going up to the Federal Circuit, uh, they did not disagree that these elements were indeed functional or had had uh, functionality uh, functional aspects, 
but they did not agree that it was appropriate to remove as aspects from the claim design. Um, instead, the Federal Circuit said that where certain elements are found to be functional, the fact finder should simply not focus on the particular designs of these elements, but rather focus on what these elements contribute to the design's overall ornamentation. So I think there's a little bit uh, of clarity lacking as to what, what they mean and how, how this will ultimately be applied by the PTAB, um, especially in view of some, some of the other uh, recent Federal Circuit decisions um, where they, I think, came at this issue from a slightly different direction, saying uh, the fact finder must look at the particular ornamental designs of those un underlying functional elements. Um, so in other words, they've instructed both to look at the particular ornamental designs, underlying functional elements, and also not to focus on the particular designs of functional elements. Um, I, think, I think ultimately where all of this leads, whether dealing with functionality or, or not, uh, the scope of a design claim is ultimately based on the overall appearance, not an element-by-element -element analysis. Uh, this needs to be remembered when arguing for a particular construction to the board, um, both as a petitioner uh, or as a patent owner. And so you know, functionality arguments um, and other claim construction arguments generally Know, can be used and, and should be used as a way to focus the board's attention on certain elements, uh, provide an advantage when it comes to the prior art analysis, but, but it's not generating a checklist of elements to determine validity or infringement or uh, you know, generating a list of elements that can be removed from the claim altogether. Uh, it's the, the overall appearance is, is what matters, matters and, and what's going to be uh, considered at the end of the day. So with that, we will turn to obviousness. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the obviousness analysis in the design patent context is different. Uh, as compared to uh, utility subjects, um, and in many cases can be less likely to lead to a finding of obviousness. Obviousness is determined based on the ordinary designer standard, whether the claim design would have been obvious to a designer of ordinary skill who designs articles of the type involved, and would, uh, I think, you know, compared to an ordinary observer, for example, applied in anticipation, uh, would have additional experience in discerning differences between uh, the, the claim design and, and prior art, for example. The obviousness analysis is, is a two-part test, and the first step of that is identifying a so-called Rosen reference, uh, a reference having basically the same visual impression as the claim design. And the, the, the key language is shown here, um, which, you know, of course, when prosecuting uh, new applications, this is language that can be uh, helpful to cite to the examiner. Um, there must be a reference of something in existence, the design characteristics of which are basically the same as the claim design, in order to support a holding of obviousness. And then second, if necessary, the Rosen reference can be modified uh, to arrive at the same overall appearance as the claim design. Now, the, the first step of the two-part analysis itself has two steps. Uh, first, one must discern the correct visual impression created by the patent design as a whole. Uh, which, as we've been discussing, generally involves creating that verbal construction of the claim design. And then second, determine whether there is a single reference that creates basically the same visual impression. Uh, 
the, the key, I mean, the primary reference needs to be quite close to the claim design. You know, the operative language from Rosen being basically the same as the claim design. Um, and it's, it's that overall impression that needs to be created by, uh, by the reference to be an appropriate Rosen reference. And then in the second step, uh, the primary reference may be modified where appropriate. But here again, uh, the secondary reference must be so related to the primary reference that the appearance of certain ornamental features in one would suggest the application of those features to the others. So in, in the obviousness context, um, the, the primary reference needs to get you most of the way there, 90% of the way there. And then if appropriate, uh, Secondary references that are closely related um, can be brought in to modify that uh, Rosen reference. And again, you know, it's it's about the overall appearance. That's what needs to be focused on when analyzing the prior art, uh, when you know preparing uh, grounds for a petition or attacking grounds, um, focusing on the overall appearance of the the claim design and you know what what the prior art references show. We'll turn now to a few examples of how this standard has been applied by the PTAB and, and how, how things have played out. Um, the the PTAB has given us some examples of, of how close a reference needs to be uh, to be an adequate Rosen reference, what can be used to modify the Rosen reference. Um, and like, like I've been saying, I think the results show, so far show that the, the primary reference needs to get you uh, relatively close to the claim design um, to gain institution. One early example comes from the ATAS international uh, petition. And there, the PTAB applied the two-part standard, found the petitioner had not identified a Rosen reference having basically the same impression as the claim design. The patent at issue, uh, a few figures from the patent are shown here, which is directed to uh, building panels. And the design patent included uh, multiple embodiments of a variety of profiles shown at right, uh, each of which has ultimately a non-symmetric profile with one or more protrusions, a uniform thickness. Um, the PTAB found that this non-symmetric profile was, was central to the overall appearance provided by uh, this claim design. And that, that finding, you know, looking at that overall non-symmetric appearance, uh, ultimately, I think, is what, what led to a finding of, uh, or, or denying institution. Um, there were several 102 grounds, several 103 grounds, based both on single references uh, and combinations of references that a uh, petitioner brought. One of these prior art references is shown here, uh, the, the so-called BKR160 panel. And looking at, at this prior art panel uh, and the claim design, I think you know, one could reasonably say that they're uh, relatively similar in appearance. The projection in the middle is is almost identical. Um, the difference really being the, the number of projections and the spacing on the panel. Um, but the result is the, the prior art panel, uh, the, the board said, it has an overall symmetric appearance compared to the claim design, which is non-symmetric. Um, and so as a result in this difference, the, the, the PTAP found the first step of the obviousness inquiry was not satisfied. Um, the prior art BKR160 panel wasn't a Rosen reference that was basically the same as the claim design uh, because of uh, the symmetric and repeating pattern. Um, and so without even getting to teachings of, of various secondary references uh, that petitioner had raised, uh, the, the, this prior art was not an appropriate primary reference couldn't be modified to arrive at the claim design. And 
And here again is a, a, another prior art publication that uh, was raised, the MPS 120 panel, uh, similarly found not to be a Rosen reference. And, and here we have a single projection like uh, the embodiment shown above of the claim design. Um, but the projection had a, a different shape, a more symmetric shape, and the result is the, the same. I think the prior art was found to have an overall appearance that was symmetric. Uh, again, the claim design is not, and so even though you have you know, uh, quite a few similarities, uh, it's not a Rosen reference. Institution is denied. And so, uh, you know, again, this is an example of uh, how close of a petitioner the art needs to be uh, to uh, show obviousness. Um, prior primary reference needs to get you almost all the way there, and then if you have that same overall visual impression, secondary references might be appropriate to you know, make any uh, slight modifications uh, that might might also be needed. So being being able to identify how the overall appearance differs, uh, you know, e even if all the, the pieces can be found in the prior art, um, y you need a, a, a close overall appearance in your primary reference. We'll, we'll take a moment here to point out the CLE code at the bottom of the slide for anyone in New York and New Jersey. CLE code, CLE code is so. Re returning now to the Johns Manville IPR, um, this this provides a counterexample of the PTAB finding the primary reference was an appropriate Rosen reference. Again, the sole photo of the design patent is shown here at the left, uh, which again is directed to insulation. Um, and the, the main prior art reference, or one of the one of the main references that was applied is, is the large photo shown at right, um, which as you can see was, was very close and that it's also insulation material having a uh, similar varied brown color, a similar texture. Uh, it even includes the waffle pattern that appeared in the photo as a result of the manufacturing process used uh, for the insulation material. So arguably the only uh, meaningful difference was the extent of color variation between the claim design and the prior art uh, with uh, the prior art photo, at least, showing a slightly more consistent uh, brown color uh, compared to the design claim. And here the result was proceedings were instituted. Uh, the PTAB found that this prior photo did provide an appearance that was basically the same, uh, making it an appropriate Rosen reference. Um, and, and ultimately because the the extent of the color variation was the only uh, real difference in the overall appearance that they found. And so the PTAB instituted both both on this prior art alone and also various secondary references uh, that were brought in to show that it would have been obvious to uh, have a, a greater variation in, in hue um, and specifically in insulation material. And you know, because of the relationship between the prior art, uh, the PTAP found that uh, they were suitable secondary references to modify uh, the primary Rosen reference. And so ultimately, uh, the PTAP instituted on both 102 and 103 combinations. Um, and th this is pending, so we'll see what the results, uh, how things play out. Um, Going forward, but uh, I think you know, with with that institution decision, it's likely that uh, the, the references will be applied 
similarly in the ultimate written decision. And again, I think you know the petitioner was helped here by the fact that the primary reference was so close, uh, and it's just minor variations. They had a, a reasonable argument that the primary reference was even a 102 reference, uh, and it's just bringing in secondary references uh, to to tweak that overall appearance. I think that's it's an example of uh, the closeness that's that's helpful to have a, a good probability of institution. And I think it also provides something to think about as a petitioner where the strategy might be slightly different than in the utility context where I think there's less hesitation to build one of three combinations. There's, the board has shown they're more than willing to uh, to entertain you know, reasonable one of three combinations. Um, in the design patent context, it's that, that primary reference really needs to get you uh, get you close in order to uh, be able to move forward with the combination. So with those examples, I think there's, uh, there's a few takeaways uh, from all of this. And we'll start, I think, both in terms of uh, as a potential petitioner uh, considering uh, an IPR proceeding or as a, a patent owner that's uh, facing a proceeding. And also going back further as uh, an applicant that's you know, building their design strategy, preparing design applications. Um, this gives us a lot to think about. So first, I, I think we're going to see, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a continued increase in design patent IPRs. Uh, it's you know, always going to be a small minority of the total IPRs. Um, but I think I think it will continue, and I think that's true uh, regardless of what what happens uh, in the upcoming uh, damages decision. Two, you know, it, it's about the prior art. Like like in the utility context, you need to give careful thought to what is the best prior art, what are the grounds that are being constructed uh, that you're going to move forward with, um, and you know, in doing that, focusing on the overall impression of the claim design, the overall impression of uh, of the prior art publications, as opposed to you know, generating a, a checklist of elements. Uh, and and again, as as we mentioned, you know, when making 103 arguments, it's it can be challenging, uh, and I think. You know, you need to have a primary reference that is going to get you get you close uh, to the design claim on its own before bringing in uh, other secondary references in order to have the best shot at institution. Um, all of that being said, like in the utility context, there are advantages as a petitioner um, short of completely rendering a design patent claim unpatentable. Uh, that can come from IPR proceedings. So, as, as we mentioned, in, in many design patents, there have been no prior art rejections, no prior art prosecution history. Uh, I think one study showed that uh, up to 75% of design patents uh, don't get prior art rejections. So, so you're coming into this with um, not not a huge record, and so. An IPR provides an avenue to provide some certainty regarding the claim scope, uh, and even beyond providing certainty, uh, additional flexibility in shaping what that claim scope is, because uh, an IPR proceeding is likely, um, in many cases, the first time that prior art has been applied, uh, and the first time that the Patent Office has provided any input on uh, the prior art with respect to the design claim. Um, so, you know, depending on, on what, what art is available, what the design claim looks like, um, it, it's, it, it provides some additional flexibility even compared to the utility context, I think, uh, in setting up uh, an argument uh, that can be used to you know, set up non-infringement positions by forcing the patent owner to choose between you know, preserving validity and damaging their 
infringement arguments or trying to maintain a, a broad construction, but weaken their validity position. Um, and so I think these considerations are accentuated a little bit in the design context, just given uh, the lack lack of record uh, up to that point in most cases. Uh, so I think it's, it's important to consider the ultimate goal and, and, and know that uh, a win can mean different things and there can be advantages even, even short of uh, ultimate uh, invalidity depending on what the the art is and you know that, that art should be selected and, and tailored to bolster uh, those positions and ultimate goals and lastly I think you know these these issues uh, or what we've been discussing should should be considered when preparing a design application as well um, Jim I think you have some some thoughts there uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Craig. Um, and I don't want to underestimate, underemphasize that last point Craig made about uh, the importance of IPR proceedings in helping to really put some meat on the bones when it comes to the scope of a design patent. As Craig said, there's very often no prosecution history, and being able to define what specifically you can and can't do um, to avoid infringing a design patent is really dependent upon the fact finder ultimately. So. Uh, providing some prosecution history through the IPR process can be very valuable to someone who wants to operate in that space. Um, but, but now looking at it from the perspective of a practitioner trying to protect designs, what should we be doing based on IPR practice? Um, um, and you know, the first bullet point here on the page is, 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 is pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but uh, just going back all the way back to those statistics to realize that half of the institutions were made based on uh, the patentee's own publication prior to the critical date um, uh, should tell us something. As practitioners, uh, sometimes when clients ask us to uh, protect designs, we think, oh, well, this should be very straightforward. This is a very low budget thing. We're going to do it really quickly, get it on file fast. Um, prior art considerations are as important in the design context as in the utility context, and we should not fail to really really put the questions of the client um, about publications. Um, there was a time not that long ago when design patents were rarely litigated, rarely ever used at all. Um, but as we've seen, uh, litigations are more common now, and the IPR process itself means that uh, these things are going to be uh, disputed more regularly. Uh, also, when you are preparing a design patent application, uh, think about how the PTAB might describe the design you're claiming. Um, again, you know, we, the design is based on the drawings. Uh, we're not asking, suggesting that you put that description into your patent application, but at least imagine how the PTAB would deal with that, uh, and 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 have that influence uh, your your decision on 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 claim scope. Uh, so often. We see people file design applications uh, with apparently little regard to the scope of what they're actually claiming. Uh, they make the seemingly um, improper uh, kind of, uh, uh, equating of the, the design with the product um, that their client is about to release, and they simply show everything in solid lines. Um, Think about the claim scope that you want to have ultimately before the PTAB or uh, before court. Um, and in that re regard, you remember back at the beginning we said that the the uh, you see the claim usually says something like I claim the ornamental design of of, of this uh, as shown and described. Uh, take advantage of the written description. And what I mean by that is. Um, a few years ago, uh, the patent office was very, very lax about allowing uh, patent applicants to severely alter the, sh the scope of the claim they had presented. They might, for example, present uh, a product design with uh, a whole bunch of shaded solid surfaces and then decide later, well, maybe I want to just limit my claim to this one area over here. Um, in the rest of the world, that's been very difficult to make that transition under a written description requirement. In the U.S., it used to be fairly easy. 
uh, in the last few years, the design uh, group at the patent office has taken a much more strict approach. Uh, frankly, it's probably appropriate that they do that. Um, but because of that, if you want to have room to modify your scope after filing, uh, drop some some points about it into the specification. You can add a you can add a line that says, for example, in some cases, going back to that connector uh, design example, in some cases there are two prongs that stick out the end of the connector that form part of the design. Now, you're going to be forced to delete that paragraph for allowance, but if something happened during prosecution and you came up with a, a piece of prior art that showed everything you showed in solid lines, but not the two prongs, uh, you, would, you would have the basis for making that modification. So uh, many companies, as you are probably aware, file multiple design applications on the same day, varying scope, or multiple embodiments uh, expecting to be restricted. Um, and then one, one last point before we take some time for questions here. When you have a critical design, uh, given, given the importance sometimes of, uh, of, of, of design protection, given the statutory damages and other sorts of things that are in the law right now, and given that for many uh, industries, uh, infringement comes in the form of of exact duplication. Uh, consider that perhaps uh, you know, the value of having a claim that is fairly narrow, and in the design context, that means a claim that really requires um, a, a product that has the exact design of of your product. Um, I recall a time when I was uh, doing a lot of design patents in the baby products industry, for example, and when someone would release a new uh, tub for bathing an infant, um, and within a month of releasing the product, there would be exact duplicates of that tub. Someone would, someone in another country would buy one of the early tubs, would cast a mold off of the exact tub and start duplicating it inexpensively and shipping it into the U.S. So oftentimes design patents are very, very helpful against that kind of knockoff, um, better protection, and very difficult to invalidate um, if, if the claim is that narrow. Um, let's see, moving, moving on then, just a couple of last slides. Um, we wanted to make sure you had some post-grant resources. Um, we always provide these in these webinars. We have a bunch of our own websites that, that give you a lot more detail than we've been able to apply here. Um, there are also a couple of very useful uh, USPTO sites, uh, of course, that you can uh, access. And uh, again, we, we invite you back for our next session of this, um, and that will be on October 12th, from 1 to 2 Eastern. Um, now, we had a few, a few questions, a um, couple of last-minute uh, points, though. Um, uh, we're going to post an on-demand replay within 48 hours. Uh, that will be on the fishpostgrant.com site. So you'll be getting a link via email to the presentation recording as well as the copy of the slides once they're available. Those of you in New York, remember to make note of course code included on the New York CLE form. They'll be forwarded to you in a follow-up email. As a reminder, the code is only for New York attorneys because they have a different requirement than the other states. Um, uh, finally, watch for our next webinar on October 12th. Again, thank you for joining us today. Um, before we leave, there were a couple of questions. Um, I'll handle the, uh, the first one. I'll get Craig, maybe you can jump in on the second. Um, sure. The first one is, uh, can design patents claim priority from a, from a utility patent? Uh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, it can even be the other way around, as the old Maharkar case uh, showed. Uh, the utility patent application has to show exactly the design. And by exactly, if you're thinking about a three-dimensional object and you're claiming a surface, uh, the drawings have to be sufficient to show the exact boundaries of that surface and contour. Often we don't do that in utility patents, so it's kind of rare that this happens, but sometimes it does happen um, in the icon context, for example, in graphic user interfaces. Um, and anyway, that, the other question I think, um, Craig, someone was asking about the, uh, uh, going back to the, um, let's see the, if I can find the... The ATAS decision. Yes, let's go back to that one here for just a second. Uh, and I think the question was specifically around the, the board talking about the prior art showing asymmetric and repeating designs versus 
or excuse me, symmetric and, and, and repeating designs versus the, the claim design being asymmetric and irregular. Um, when it seems like the, at least one of the, the examples or one of the prior art uh, shown is, is in fact asymmetric. Um, and I, I think, you know, they were emphasizing the, the regularly repeating uh, spacing of the projections, which compared to you know, the, the figure that, uh, well, all of these have irregular spacing as opposed to multiple projections uh, across the panel. And I think that's what the board was getting at. Um, so this is a good example then, Craig, of the overall impression. In other words, it's not just yeah. that it has an asymmetric, uh, the, the, the projection itself has an asymmetry to it, which was also in the prior art. It's that the positioning of that and the irregular spacing around that gave an overall impression that was not in the prior art. Exactly. And I think, right, right. I mean, each, each of the elements, if you break it down, could be found, um, but it's, the, the board wasn't willing to allow uh, allow that to be reconstructed after the fact to uh, get to the claim design. Okay. Well, we've taken you a, a few minutes over. Um, again, if there are any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to any of us, to either of us. Um, uh, but uh, we we thank you for your time um, that you've uh, spent with us today. And uh, if we can be of any help, uh, please let us know.